بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Although it was announced that uh, we are going to have a course on child upbringing, but you know, two days is not enough. It means at least it requires at least one week or two weeks because there are so many phases of child upbringing which are very, very important. Uh, so what I have done is I will first of all look at an introduction and I will ask about two to three questions and we will try to respond to these questions, which are very important which actually will give us the keys of child upbringing. Once you have the keys of child upbringing, you will have so much knowledge about child upbringing. The Holy Quran in chapter 25, verse number 74, mentions a dua of a group of people who are known as Ibadul Rahman. Ibadul Rahman literally is translated as servants of the all beneficent. But you know in Arabic, the word Ibad and Abid, both are plural of Abd. See, the, but there is a difference which is worthy of consideration. Because Abid, are, is the plural of abd in a coercive connotation. What does that mean? That means, you know, uh, existentially, we don't have power but to exist. Allah is giving us existence. We can't say that uh, we don't to exist, oh Allah. No, we can't say that. Even after, let's say, a person does suicide, still the bones and whatever the remains that is there, is there because there is a kun that is there of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the whole world of existence is like that. Every moment, the existence that we get is because Allah is always saying kun. It's not like the Jews, a group of Jews who would say that, you know, Yadullah maghlula, after Allah has created, now his hands are tied, he can't do anything. No. Every moment we are getting the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya da'im al-fadli ala al Anyway, let's not go into these things. There are so many things to be spoken in this. But we were talking about ibad. The word ibad is the plural of abd. Sometimes that abd is because he is submissive existentially. That's why he's known as abd. All of us are like that. So all of our, us are abid in that sense. Ibad is that servant who knows Allah and then accepts Allah and loves Allah and obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibad is not like abid. And that's why here, abidur Rahman was not used. Ibadur Rahman was used. Now, Ibadur Rahman, of course, this is a very beautiful passage of Surah Al-Furqan, it talks about who they are. They are the people who are, you know, uh, very, very kind and merciful to all the humankind. You see, even their interaction with the kuffar is, is not like the way uh, an ignorant, uh, for example, uh, starts dealing with the Christians or the, the Jews or the other religious uh, people. He is, is a kind of human interaction which is very powerful. Anyway, so there is a lot to be discussed, but one of the du'as that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, which is very important, is what is this du'a that, is, that we are going to mention, and it talks about what kind of child we would like to bring up. They say, Rabbana, O Lord, hablana, gift us, min azwajina, from our wives, 
وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا and our offsprings قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ actually it is literally translated as apple of the eyes but then in, in Arabic there is an intricacy those who know or who are learning Arabic they would realize this there is an intricacy you see sometimes tears that come out from your eyes are hot tears sometimes when you, when you cry hot tears come out from your eyes but sometimes cool tears come out and notice this that, for example, you have missed your child because he has gone for a crash course in Iran, for example, for only two weeks. But because you were very close, you missed him very much. When he came back, you started crying. And when you started crying, the tears that came out were cool tears. And then they settled down. This is known as Qurratul A'yur or Qurratul Ayn. Quratul Ayn is that tear that settles and is cool. Alright? So, these actually, these great people, Ibadul Rahman, are asking Allah that, Oh Allah, give us such spouses and such children that when we look at them, we really feel cool in our eyes. We are very happy. Actually, this feeling of coolness of the eyes doesn't mean that always you start crying when you look at them. But it shows that, you know, you are so, you love them in such a way, you know that their character is excellent. But there is something very interesting. It continues. It says, Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. And make us imams of the muttaqin. That means that I can, should not be overwhelmed with the wife that I have or the child that I have. Love is there for them, but I'm not affected. I'm so powerful that at the same time that I have this ni'mah of Allah, I also am an imam of the muttaqin. That means I am spiritually powerful also. I'm not affected by hubbul walad and hubbul nisa and vice versa, obviously. But this is a very powerful dua. This shows that, you know, getting a good wife and getting a good child is good. It's something that you should go for. But this should not hamper you from being muttaqi. Not only muttaqi, they would say, وَجْعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ No. وَجْعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا إِمَامًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ That's a very high thing. They are asking for being leaders of those who are Anyway, this was the goal that we ought to achieve, right, in our discussion. That how should we rear the child, because it's not like that, that you know, that you start, you know, having these beautiful experiences after the child grows, and you don't train him well. This cannot transpire. Anyway, as an introduction, there is a discussion that I want to mention before we go to the stages of child upbringing, and that is, that previously, in philosophy, child upbringing would be a part of philosophy. Philosophy before was divided into theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. Theoretical philosophy was subdivided into mathematics, logics, metaphysics, science, and so on. So even, even mathematics was philosophy at that time. If you look at the Aristotelian division of the sciences, you'll come to realize that actually these divisions were there. Theoretical philosophy, under theoretical philosophy, we have all these subjects. Even science was a part of theoretical philosophy. But practical philosophy was divided into three important categories, which I would like to mention here. I don't know, this is long enough so that I can around freely or not? It isn't. <laughs> when we talk about practical philosophy, it was divided into three important categories. One was called Siyasatul Nafs. You 
see the word siyasa that afterwards was known as politics is actually the literal meaning of siyasa means to control and to manage. All right? Siyasa to nafs is the same thing as what we know as in good akhlaq. Right? Management of the soul. This was a part of practical things. And then came siyasa to manzil. Siyasatul Manzil was also known as, you know, the word economics. I would like you to do some homework for me. Go to the word economics and look at the etymology of economics. You'll find that it is not what we know about it today. Economics comes from the word oikonomia, and that means the management of the house. How should we manage the house? But because one of the most important things was management of how to spend and so on, it came to be known as economics. So, this, this is Tadbirul Manzil, or you can say, today, obviously, in Arabic it is better to say Tadbirul Manzil. Or even Siyasatul Manzil, control of the house. This is the literal uh, what, translation and the literal expression for it. And then we have, finally, Siyasatul Mudul. Siyasat al Mudul. Which we say politics. Management of the country and the cities. Now, this was so beautiful uh, when it came to the division and the categorization because. It was such that if a person has not got siyasa to nafs, then he can't go through siyasa to manzil. And if a person has not finished siyasa to manzil, he cannot go to siyasa to mudun. So if a person has purified his soul, that means that he has already, now he's ready to get a wife. But if he has not purified his soul, and for example, his uh, faculties of desire, anger, and appetite are not in the state of equilibrium, then to, you know, to get a wife is easy, but you will find that there will be a lot of problems. He will not be able to control the manzil. See, of course, when it comes to siyasatul manzil, it's a whole science. Inshallah, if we get the opportunity, I would like to discuss this especially. What, what kind of house can you get? Where should it be? What is the, for example, that the height of the house, the, everything about the house and location, and then in the house, what are the things to be listened, what are the things to be done? This is a whole science of Tadbirul Manzil. So if a person has not gone through this, this first, then he cannot go through this. Sometimes we find it is funny that a person has not gone through this and he is doing this already. Because, you know, we have what we call Jamaats, isn't it? We are controlling a society. It's a mini country or a mini city, we can say. It's a society that we are controlling. You see that sometimes we have not yet finished these and we are going to this. And we have not finished this and we are in this. So, this is a very logical way of expression of what to be learned and where to go, where to start from. Siyasatul Nafs and then Siyasatul Manzil and Siyasatul Mudun. Ibn Sina has got a very good treatise. Unfortunately, it is only in Arabic and Persian. But if it is translated, it will be very helpful to you people. Because, you know, he is there, he is talking about Siyasatul Manzil. And he's telling us that how, for example, to start with the child. What should we look at the child? How should we, for example, monitor the child's behavior slowly and gradually? There is another book also I'm going to introduce to you. It's translated into English, and it's one of the best books on this. Inshallah, I will give you some, some names, then you can go and try to get them. Because unfortunately, this has not been discussed, or is not being discussed even in our uh, houses today. There was a time when Sheikh Nasiruddin Tusi was discussing Siyasatul Manzil. Ibn Sina also discussed Siyasatul Manzil, and so on. Now, this was just an introduction for you to know where are we? We are talking about the second phase of management. If we are able to control our children properly, then we can try to take up higher posts. 
of, for example, becoming the chairman of a place or becoming, the, for example, the head of a certain, for example, area and so on. Now, one of the most important things that we would like to discuss, because now I know if I go into these technicalities, then we will not be able to cover what we want to cover, and we only have two sessions. The first question that I would like to ask, because all of you are paying attention and you are interested, I would like to make it an interactive discussion, so I would like you to answer when I ask you, all right? The question is, when does child upbringing begin? When does it begin? When does it begin? Before marriage takes place. Before marriage takes place. When? Before marriage, when? <coughs> while choosing your spouse, okay? Before marriage takes place, while choosing your spouse, when does it take place? Um, I have read in a book that it starts before 20 years okay. of getting a child. It is because your parents need to train you to get a nice child. So it's like 20 years before you get a child. All these answers are right. Even this answer is very good. 20 years before. What else? What other answer do you have? Yes? Maybe at Buluk. At Buluk? Yeah, so once you become Balik, yeah. and you're conscious of your action, yeah. then anything that you do has an effect, okay. and then it just carries forward until you choose your spouse. No, but I'm talking about the child upbringing, uh, tra training the child. You, it's not in that buluk time. Buluk time is very far. Mm -hmm. That means you leave the child, whatever he does, till buluk. Sing it our no, 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 own buluk. Parents buluk. The parents buluk. Yes, yeah, so that is. A, a mother becomes valid, a woman becomes valid, and a man becomes valid. Okay, so you are saying that this is the time that is before the marriage and before before. Okay, all right. This is one good opinion also. The, the, the men should also give us their, their opinion. They've given an answer. Sorry? They've given the answers. They've, they've given the answers? Same answer. There is one other answer I would like. Yes. As soon as the child is born? As soon as the child is born is another answer. A concept. As soon as the woman conceives, she should know how this child is to be born. Okay, there is another answer also I need. Because I want to try to show all the proofs of what you have already mentioned. And then we will look at the real answer. That when does it consciously begin? When do we really train the child? I think from one year. When a child is one yes. year. And, uh, just when the... Uh, I guess pregnancy has a lot to do with it because it comes to the food. Uh, oh, very good, very good. That's what I wanted. Prenatal stage, isn't it? Prenatal. Okay. One more answer. I think uh, if the child is in the womb, the mother should tell the child, okay, I'm going to do wudu, talk to the child as the child is in the womb. Yeah, so it's prenatal, the same thing that mm -hmm. I need here. Okay. okay, you have any other? Yes? Even before you decide to have a child. Very good. Yeah, there's also another answer. All right. Let us look at the answers one by one. And let us look at a proof for each and every answer that we have mentioned. All these are important stages. But then we will look at, you know, which is actually the answer of when do we literally start training the child. All right? And that is very clear. All of you know when do literally we start training the child. First is after birth. All right? One of you mentioned after birth. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa is reported to have said that every newborn baby, Kullu Mauludin, Yulad Al Fitra. Every newborn baby is born with fitrat, with an innate nature which is which every human being has naturally. That means you know he likes good. He hates bad. He doesn't. He knows things which are dirty. He doesn't. He doesn't like, and so on. But of course, as he grows, he understands things better. In that level, there are things which he understands, which 
uh, there are some things which he would not understand in that level, but as he grows, he will understand more. So, كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدْ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ حَتَّى يَكُونَ أَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانَهُ وَيُنَصِّرَانَهُ وَيُمَجِّسَانَهُ Until his parents turn them to be Jews or Christians or Magians. So it means that, you know, the change that happens is not genetically. You see, or some people say that it's only nurture. You see, there's a debate between nature and nurture. Google this, it's very interesting. And I think Dr. Saheb here knows about it because he's also in this field. That does nature influence child upbringing or nurture? That means, you know, the environment and how you nurture the child. Some are of the opinion that actually it is nature only. You know, it is the genes that have given every information. And then there is another group that says it is, no, it is nurture. You don't talk about these genes. They don't have any effect. But Islam takes the moderate course, that nature as well as nurture. Not that these genes don't affect. No, they do affect. They have a kind of facilitation. Not that they have, they have a, a cause which is a perfect cause. When you talk about a complete and perfect cause, that means that if because he is the son of this person, he will become this way. This, this is not there. So it's not a cause which is a complete cause, but it is a facilitation. It can be changed. يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ Beautiful words of the Holy Quran where one of the uh, Ahlul Bayt والسلام, says, you know this, that Allah takes out the dead from the living and the living from the dead is he takes out the kafir from a Muslim and a Muslim from a kafir. So it's not that everything is written in genes, and, but there is an influence that the parents make. And that is why this, this shows that, you know, actually child upbringing begins after the birth of the child. That's how when, you know, the environment is Jewish, for example, the environment is Christian, the environment is atheist, for example, you find the child uh, is controlled like that and he continues his life like that till he becomes a Jew or a Christian and so on. <coughs> now this is, uh, the, I do have all the references of what I'm saying, but I just don't want to mention because of the time that we have. Another opinion that the boys mentioned actually, the men mentioned here, is that it starts in the prenatal stage. There's a very um, good psychologist, uh, uh, Dr. Thomas uh, Verney. He is a specialist in prenatal parenting. He has written a very good, good book on prenatal parenting. And as I was going through it, and of course there are so many books on prenatal parenting, you have to get something which is very powerfully written with all the intricacies. This Dr. Verney uh, really put a lot of pains and came to realize that everything that the mother and the father does throughout the prenatal stage affects the child. So the kind of, for example, movie the, the mother watches, or the kind of you know, interaction the father makes with the mother, for example, he's always angry, and the, the kind of you know, effects that come in the soul of the mother and so on, all these things are transferred to the child. And that is why you will be surprised. Have you seen some children, when they are young, they have not yet grown, they are, for example, less than one year, but they are always smiling still in that age. They are not yet one, but they are smiling. While you find that there are children who are not yet one, but they are not smiling. They are always, you know, as if they, there is a problem, and they are, they are they, you know, their faces face is such that, you know, it's, it's as if they, they are hurt or... Not that they are hurt, actually, but all these things affect from the time of the prenatal stage. And they have, he has got very beautiful proofs. Read the book. It's very good. A part of it can be read properly. Another part needs uh, a person to be an expert in, in biology and microbiology and all these things. But it's a very good book. And in this uh, sacred effusion, when I've uh, talked about Assalamu alaikum ya binta, Fatima al Zahra, I have mentioned him and I've mentioned a quotation. There are some quotations, beautiful quotations already in the internet. You will find them and it will really help you. 
the khulasat ul kalam that is if you take the synopsis and the gist of what i would like to say is that the prenatal stage is very important what is the dalil for this from the islamic viewpoint the dalil that some of the ulama bring is this beautiful hadith of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wa ali The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is reported to have said Al-Shaqiyu Man shaqiya fi batni ummi Wa sa'idu Man sa'uda fi batni ummi The wretched Shaqi is a person who is wretched The wretched one is a wretched one In the womb of his mother And the prosperous And felicitous one Is the felicitous one In the womb of the mother now this is a very beautiful hadith, but it is ذو أبعاد كثيرة. It's not something that you know you can interpret in you know one superficial interpretation. No, one of the interpretations given in the hadith itself. Somebody asks one of the imam عليه السلام. The, the imam replies that actually Allah knows that this child, what will he do afterwards and what he will become, so actually he is wretched from when he is born, from that angle. This is one of the interpretations. Another interpretation which is interesting is that actually it is the mother who can make the child wretched or the mother who can make the child prosperous in terms of the physical as well as spiritual makeup, up to a certain level, up to a certain level. Because sometimes what happens is that, yes, the child starts with shakawa and wretchedness, but because of change, because of struggle on the part of the mother and the father, there is a change. It's not that everything is finished. You know, inshallah, you are going to, when you uh, are, uh, going to attend the Adala conference, perhaps this subject will come up. But I'm, I just want to mention this as a very, uh, we can say, as a synopsis of what is the reality. We have two stations. We have Al-Lawhul Mahu wal Ithbat and we have Lawhul Mahfuz. Okay? Lawhul Mahu wal Ithbat is such that it can be erased and it can be established. You know, that's why there's one of the du'as that we recite in the holy month of Ramadan, in Laylatul Qadr, that, Oh Allah, if you have written me as a shaqi, then make me a sa'id. So it means that you can change, even if it is written in the tablet. The tablet that can be erased and can be established. This is known as lawhul mahu wal ithbat. This thing is shown by people who dream also. If you dream and you are a powerful person, pure person inside, then you can have such dreams that you can see what's going to happen, let's say tomorrow or after one week and so on. And if it's going to be a bad dream, you're told that immediately go to sajda and say, oh Allah, don't make it happen and so on. It's not going to happen. So it means it can change. So at that time when you saw it, it means it's going to happen. But then it can change because you don't have the ultimate knowledge. That ultimate knowledge of what will happen, then what will happen, then what will happen, up to the end. That is known as Allahul Mahfud that the Aima alayhim salam know. That's a very high station. That is in the Allah Azza wa Jal. Alright? So anyway, this shaqawa that is wretchedness and sa'ada, it can start like that. The mother is not caring. She is looking at whatever movies she would like to watch, for example, and going to cinema and going to do whatever she wants, listening to music, becoming angry with the other children, and so on, all these things. But afterwards, she realizes after, for example, the baby has grown for, let's say, it has become two years old, and she cries, and that's Tawbah and all that. Do you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the baby the way it is? You know, it's not that. No. It can change. Alright? So, 
the shakawa and saada can be formed in the prenatal stage. So that was also a very good answer that was given from the men's side. The third answer that you gave is before conception. Now I'll give you a list and I want you to look at this book. It's a very beautiful book. It's known as From Marriage to Parenthood. Read it carefully because there are some things that uh, the authors have really put pains and really brought some very important keys. I just want to give you a list of what are the things which are important before conception because that really affects the child. Positively or negatively. Number one, narrations of the timings of interaction. Okay, interaction, when I talk about interaction, I mean, I mean intimacy. I don't want to go and use the three-letter word here, all right? This, when I say interaction or intimate interaction, it means that, all right? So before this conception, or uh, before interaction, what are the timings that you observed? What are the timings that you did this with your husband or the husband did with the wife? You know, it is so important. I'll just give you one hadith, all right? Which will make you realize how important it is. It is said that if a person uh, has this matrimonial interaction with the wife at after Isha of Thursday, kada an yakun al waladu min al afrad. That means, if a person has that interaction after Isha of Thursday, then it is near that that child becomes from the Afrad, those people who travel to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without the teacher and become very high in status. So it's as if that, you see, when, when you're told, Kada an yakuna, it is near that he will become. But if you give him a very bad environment, he might not become. But this is the, one of the most important facilities. And there are so many hadith. You will find these a hadith here very beautifully given, so you can have a look. There are also narrations of the states of intimate interaction. States, which is very important. You should, one should not talk, for example, because if one talks while doing that, then the child will become, for example, he will not be able to talk. He would. Or, for example, if somebody looks at some things, for example, while interaction, that the child will become blind, and so on. These hadith are there. But there is also something else I would like to tell you. You see, sometimes we do this because of physical pleasure. Either the husband or the wife, no problem. That is something which is halal and tayyib because it is in the framework of marriage, so there is no problem. But if you want to get the best kind of child, then both should be happy and both should have that uh, kind of bond expressed before that interaction. Very important. And the child that comes out or is conceived, if it resembles the father and the mother, both, then know that the wife and the husband were in love. Really. This is there in the Rivayat. That means that out of true love, this baby has come. But if they resemble their uncles and aunts, <laughs> then there was problem. <laughs> there is distress. And this, I'm, I'm, I'm basing all this in riwayat. It's not from my own pocket. Inshallah, if you want any riwayat in particular, I'll give it to you. Also, there is a, another very important thing that, that uh, we have narrations about before conception, and that is the food that you eat. Very important. Like, for example, we have that hadith, some of you may have seen, that there was a very handsome child brought near one of the imams, and the imam said that the father of this child has eaten queen's, queen's fruit before conception, before interaction, so that that child becomes so handsome or so beautiful, whatever. The queen's fruit is something that is available in some countries. In Iran, there is plenty. We also have jam of queen's fruit. So if you really want, want it from Iran, those who go to Iran, they can ask for the jam if you don't get the fruit itself. Anyway, 
So it's not only that. There are some very important foods and their effects, spiritual effects. Unfortunately, we don't have this in English, but we have an encyclopedia of, of the kind of fruits and vegetables a person can eat and how powerful it has an effect in the child and so on. For example, one of the things that really makes yourself Nurani as well as the child is uh, pomegranate. Eating it on a Friday before having eaten anything or drunk anything in the morning. And that gives you power for 40 days, noor for 40 days. If you are able to eat two, then 80 days. This is there in the Rivaya also. And when you eat it, don't share. <laughs> because it is said in one hadith that, you know, there is no one seed of it, which is the seed of Jannah. So try to get, don't even, the, the moment you open and you see some brown seeds and all that, shaitan comes and tells you, you know, no, you'll not get it. You are, you are not gentle. No, you will get it. And you might get it now and again. And if you have eaten that seed, then the conception that will transpire will be like that of Bibi Fatima Zahra salam, because the fruit that the Prophet ate from that fruit of Jannah, Bibi Fatima Zahra salam, was born. So we should also try whatever we can. So food is also very important before conception. Another area, and many of these things, nearly everything is there here. So, you know, this is a very good book. You have it, and it is there in PDF form also. You can download it from the internet. Narrations on what to think while intimate interaction. Very important. Narrations of what to think. You see, if you, if the, I'll tell you, the riwayah is like this. If the husband thinks of another woman while he's interacting with his wife, perhaps because of getting interested in getting married to another one or looking at somebody else's wife with uh, lust and so on, which is all haram. But if this happens, that the child that is going to be born will be a khuntha, male and female. What do you call that in English? Yeah, what the doctor just said, can you say it loudly, I don't know. Hermaphrodite. Hermaphrodite, all right. So it's like that. And you'll, you'll see this, these people in India, I've seen so many, because when, when I went in India, I saw, uh, this is, is she a woman or she's a man, male? So the face is like a male, and she has male characteristics, but she's a female, and so on. So if you don't want that, the husband should control his imagination. A very important thing that we learned when we were young, that you know, if the mother who is pregnant looks at a very beautiful photo, then the child will also become like that. That is wrong. <laughs> Actually, that is wrong. According to Imam Ali alayhi salam, there is a hadith that says that if you think about a good thing, like Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and his personality and all that, you'll find that the child will have such a personality and he will have noon and so on. In fact, when there is interaction done, you should start reciting the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is halalun tayyib. You are not doing zina or you are not doing something which is haram. You are doing halalun tayyib in the way Allah wants. I read a hadith which was ajeeb also. Listen to this carefully. Especially on 13th, 14th, 15th night, you are told that you should not have interaction first night and last night also, the lunar month. 15th night, why? Because the jinns also, they have interaction with their females. So what they do, but they, the, uh, the evil jinns I'm talking about, that evil jinns, what they do, they also come to your room and they also want to do with your wife also. So, so it becomes shariku shaitan. And that's why you are told in a hadith from one of the Aimma alayhi salam that when you want to be near your wife, that say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And the shaitan will go away. And of course, this should not be done on the 15th night because if that happens, the child becomes mad. We have this hadith in this book. So I'm just giving you a glimpse of some of the things. Most important is your imagination. Make it so pure. Think about your husband, and the wife also should think about 
the, uh, what the, the husband should think about the wife, and wife should think about the husband, and so on. Don't think about some other things. That is not good. <coughs> Another very important point before conception. You know, in one of the hadith, inshallah, if, if the, whatever hadith, as I told you, you want, I'll give it to you. The only thing is I want to go fast. That's why I'm not mentioning the reference. It is mentioned that before conception of, or before the interaction of the Holy Prophet with Bibi Khadija, السلام, the Prophet went to do ibadah for 40 days. All right? And then, Bibi Fatima Zahra السلام, was conceived and so on. There is a secret I want to tell you. Any amal that you start, if you do it for 40 days, there is an effect. But before 40 days, don't expect the effect. So, for 40 days you fast for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For 40 days you recite Ziyarat Ashura. For 40 days you, you recite those the dhikr like إِنَّ رَبَّكُمُ اللَّهُ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامِ The 70, 70 times that makes you very powerful. Your iman becomes powerful. For 40 days you do that. See the effect. It is tremendous. And 40 is a key for the effect. All right? This is given by Ayatollah Hassan Zadi Amuli in his book, Noorun Ala Noor. So this is one of the keys before conception. Another view that one of the ladies mentioned, which was also a very beautiful view, is before spouse selection. That child upbringing starts before spouse selection. And that is also right. We have some hadith which are very interesting. For example, look at this hadith. This is from Al Kafi. Qama Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi khatiban faqala ayyuhun nas iyyakum wa khatra'u al-dimn. Qila ya Rasulullah wa ma khatra'u al-dimn? Qala al-mar'atu al-hasana fi manbati al-su. The Holy Prophet once addressing the people said, Ayyuhun Nas, O people, beware of the verdure that grows over dung. You know that greenery that you see over dung? Beware of it. Qila, Ya Rasulullah, one person said, Ya Rasulullah, wa ma khadra uddiman. What do you mean that we beware of that greenery over dung? The Prophet said, a beautiful woman, but of evil parents. Beware of that. She may be very beautiful and vice versa. Here, there was a very beautiful interpretation Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli gave, one of the great Mufassirun today. He said that this is just a principle that is given here by the Holy Prophet. Don't think it is literally only a beautiful woman of evil parents. It also means a beautiful male or a handsome male from evil parents. Same. So, this is one of the things that tells us that actually shows that that growth is bad itself. And the, the, whatever, whatever will happen after that also will be very bad. So, you should be very careful of that. There is another hadith also which is interesting. Again, this is in Al-Kafi. إِيَّاكُمْ وَتَزْوِيجُ الْحَمْقَى فَإِنَّ سُحْبَتَهَا بَلَاء وَوُلْدَهَا ضِيَاءٌ This is an ajib tradition. You know, I have, I have done some research. I want to tell you this hadith and I want to give you another section of this hadith. This hadith says that, you know, beware of marrying with stupid women. Now, when you say stupid women, we don't mean mad women. Hamqa is a woman who is interested in food and drink and, and clothing and all that. But if you tell her that let's go in the mosque on time, no, no. if you tell her that you know there is khushali today, instead of you know really thinking about which, which lecturer will come, she'll say what clothes will I wear and so on. So everything is worldly, you know. And also hamka also refers to one who is a tube light. You know what I mean by tube light? 
one who is, for example, uh, you know, uh, cannot analyze. You are trying to analyze something. She is listening, listening. So, kida? <laughs> she doesn't know. And vice versa, obviously. Males also are like that. But then, there are a hadith that say that don't marry stupid women, but stupid, uh, good women, intellectual women, can marry stupid men. No problem. Yeah. That is no problem. Because the child, the child is with the woman, isn't it, for nine months. So it, if it's a stupid woman, you can imagine carrying a child for nine months in that way. But the male is not caring, isn't it? So perhaps this is the secret. I'm saying perhaps this is the secret. This is what, what I analyzed. There can be another analysis. But in Riwayat, we are told that the Ahmaq, no problem, can marry with a, an intellectual woman. But vice versa, don't do that. There must be a reason. Anyway, this is one of the reasons given. Another answer to when the conception or when the child upbringing starts was given by one of the sisters here. And that is also very, very important. She said 20 years before the birth. But according to Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Centuries before the birth. Centuries. Look at uh, Dua Arafah. Recite a salawat, please. I'll just give you the translation of the, the Arabic you read it, inshallah. It's a part of Dua Arafah that we recite. You created me from clay, then established me in the loins, safe from the unpredictable turn of destiny and the difference of times. Then, I have been shifting from the loin to the womb along the course of the bygone days and the past centuries. That means, Imam Hussain says that, O oh Allah, I've been traveling through the different wombs and loins up to where I came. It's not that I just traveled from the womb of Ibn Fatima Zahra and the loin of Imam Ali salam, but centuries till I came. So this is one of the very beautiful uh, indications. Another one is what we recite in Ziyarat Warith. Ashhadu annaka kunta nooran fil aslabi shamikha wal arhamil mutahara. I bear witness that you are a light in very lofty wombs. Fil arhami shamikha. Fil, sorry. Ashhadu annaka. And pure wombs. So you did not come out from one womb and one loin. No. You had come out from very pure wombs of the past. The past ladies who carried your light and continued. Similarly, we also have the same thing. You see, another thing very important, somebody would say, no, but we were Hindus before. What, what kind of purity we had? No. Hindu religion also, if you look at the Upanishad, you look at the Panchatantra, and you look at so many of these books, they are realities. Today, a book like Panchatantra is, has been translated into Arabic and Farsi, and it has been taught, and it has been commented by great ulama who are Urafa. Panchatantra is known as, uh, it's known as Panchatantra, but in, in Arabic and Farsi, it is known as Kalile wa Dumne. It talks about animals. It talks about some very important stories that talk about lofty concepts of religion. So it is not something that we should say because it is from Hinduism. Hinduism at, it, at one time was correct. We had prophets and so on. It was after that which was interpolated. The interpolation version is what we have today, which we can't accept. But if you look at the past, you'll find that some of these are known to be prophets also. But we cannot for sure say that this was a prophet or that was a prophet. Allama Tabatabai in Al-Mizan mentions this. He says if you look at these books, you'll find pure Tawheed. Pure Tawheed from these books. But what we have to do is try to analyze and look at the good things and leave the things which are incorrect. So anyway, this, this was a very important question. But what is the answer? The answer is conscious child upbringing starts after the birth of a child. It's when the conscious child upbringing starts. Although all these phases are important. 
You see, I always tell one very important thing to the youth who want to, who want to get married, that make your aqaid and akhlaq powerful, and then get married. Then, of course, spouse selection is something very important. And then after that, you really have a very powerful life. But if you don't have, if you have a shaky aqaid, a shaky akhlaq, and you get married, and then you will have problems. Obviously, it is not that everything is over, no. It's going to, you can really manage, but then it will take a lot of problems. Now, let's quickly start the course, okay? The second question is, what are the stages of child upbringing? Today we will look at the first stage of it. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa in a very well-known tradition says that a newborn child is a master for seven years, the first seven years, and a slave for the second seven years, and a prime minister for the third seven years. Today we will look at the first seven years. I will just give you some points because this can be discussed. We can, what we can do is, inshallah, if we get the, another opportunity, we will discuss this in detail. But today I'm going to give you only in point form. But because it is interactive, if you really have any questions in between, you can ask. There is no problem. Right? One, one of the most important things in this phase, which the mother should really be careful of, is to teach the child how to practically obey. Practically obey. How to practically obey? How? Not by words, no. When the child says, Mama, do this, and you know that it's not something which is haram or it will hurt him or something, do it. Can you off that light, please? Do it. Can you, for example, put something for me soft here? It's so hard here, this, I don't like it. Especially when they start talking, it becomes a really difficult thing, isn't it? Do this for me, do that for me. And questions continue and continue. I've seen uh, one example just when I was in Mombasa just now. There was a young child asking the father, okay, look, look at this, you know, I can do this. And the, the, child, the father is, you know, really, is getting problems in answering all these questions because he has to look at something else. But then you are told that at that time, if you are very patient and you look at the child with love and you continue like this, then you are practically teaching him how to obey in the love manner, not in the manner of, ah, okay. So sometimes you can obey the child, but your reaction is not a good reaction. It is not out of love. So what I have done now is I've given you, I'm going to give you some bullet points of how to practically obey the child. All right? Number one is whenever the child asks you something which obviously you know that you can obey, like for example, I want water, I want to do this, take me to look at that picture, do this for me, uh, carry me, for example, and so on. It's going to be difficult for you, but the first important stage or first important point in obedience is show the willingness. Never make him think that you are not willing. Never make him think that ah, you are tired or you are, no, you are stressed out or no. Because here you are actually training the child how to obey. And you will find after seven years, even if he is in problems, he will just smile and say, okay, mother, I'll do that. Why? Because you taught him for seven years. He also saw you that you are, you are, for example, you have perspiration and you have gone through difficulties and all that. But still he says, but this is how to act. I will also act like that. Willingness, number one. Number two, swiftness. Upachikaris. Mommy, I off kai na ko. better? This procrastination and pachikaris and pachikaris, sometimes it never even comes, actually. This should be avoided. It should be prompt, swiftness of action. And obviously, if you can't do it swiftly, there is a way of trying to divert his attention and make him think something else so that he is still happy. You'll be surprised. I saw a young lad 
in one of these countries, the mother would do this same trick of trying to divert the attention when you don't, when you don't, you can't do it because of a lot of problems. A time came that the mother said that he also diverts my attention sometimes. <laughs> so, they, you see, when it comes to uh, what obedience, the second thing is swiftness. The third thing is perfection in obedience. Make it nicely, properly, the way he likes it. Do the job perfectly. That is obedience. Even the Quran tells, Ahsanu Amala. Isn't it? Ahsanu Amala. If you want to pray, pray properly. Say, Oh Allah, I am a new lover. I am an ashik. So I am going to do the, for example, the wudu properly with the duas. Come on time. Do all these things. Similarly, the child, if you show perfection, then after the seventh year, see how perfect he is doing things. That even your neighbor will say, But you know what kind of child you have? When you tell him to do something, he does it so perfectly. But he does, she doesn't know that you have been working on the child indirectly. The child, you don't have to say, you know, Ahsan wa amala, so you have to do perfect. No, you don't. You just do it perfectly. If, for example, he says, please change me, and you quickly have a pamper and just change like this, and he's observing everything. He knows that the mother has done it. I love the mother, but the mother is doing this way. But if you, for example, change the pamper and you're smiling at the child and you're saying, that, you know, you look so nice, please do. And so on, you'll find that after seven years, the child is doing the same things. Very lovely. In fact, you'll be surprised. You know, this child is trying to show love like this to me. But you'll enjoy it. And that love will grow. You know, you'll be surprised. The Holy Quran, for family, it uses the word ahl. You see, the word family, you can use usra also. You can use aila also. Aila refers to support given by the father and all that. Because the family gets the support and they are poor in, in reality, because they don't have any means, so the father provides, so they are aila. But Allah doesn't use the word aila for family. You know what he uses? Ahl. And Ahl is what? Those, those people who are intimate with you. Intimacy. So Ahl means those people who love you. That should be the family. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces. The third, the fourth thing which is very important when it comes to obedience is control in obedience. Very important. Yes, whatever they want, their masters give them but there are some things they want which, are, which is detrimental for them. So don't give them. Because actually, if he really was a master, he would come to know that this is not good for me. So this parent, knowing that I'm a master, gave me this. She did wrong. So controlled obedience with diversion of attention. Because diversion is one of the most important things. And when you divert, his attention or try to explain to him in very beautiful words one day what will happen after seven years when the time of obedience would come and he is for example he has so much homework to do and you tell him that can you go and buy this 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 he will say you know actually i really want to go and buy oh mother i will go and buy but you know there is something remaining can i really finish that so see what he has done is the same thing that you did but now he's doing it because he has learned it practically. So these are four important things when it comes to practically obeying the child. If you practically obey the child, you'll see that the child will practically obey you. And you know, the second phase, obviously I'll tell you, the second phase is not the phase of commanding the child because of your own wings. No, it is something like commanding the child because of his own betterment. Shall we look at that? The second very important thing is that the second stage is the period, so the, sorry, the second important thing in this first stage is the period of experience and experimentation. This, the first phase, is actually a period of experience and experimentation. So that the kind of gadgets you have at home, 
the kind of, for example, chit chat which is going on in the table, the kind of interaction of the parents, everything he experiences it. And in this, I have some points. Let me jot down these points, which are very important. It will help you. Number one is <clears throat> the father should ensure that the location of the house is very important. I saw, for example, the house which is just opposite these nightclubs. Now, the person had already bought that house years ago, and now he could not change. But the nightclubs came after 20 years in that place. But still, the voice of music is continuous, does affect the child. It does affect the child negatively, although it stimulates the brain, that is a positive effect, but it affects negatively because every sound has an effect. I'll just tell you something very important. Allama Tabatabai had a brother known as Sayyid Ilahi Tabatabai. He was also very powerful. But Sayyid Ilahi Tabatabai hadn't written a lot like Allama Tabatabai wrote. He wrote a book on music. Sayyid Ilahi wrote a book on music. What sound effects where, in what part of the brain, and so on. How is, you know, these, these songs that the mom recites, that, uh, what do you call? Lullaby. Yeah, lullaby and all these things. How does it affect the brain? And uh, what sound affects how and so on? He, brought, he wrote an epistle and thereafter he came to realize that it would be misused, so he tore it and he confiscated it. What I wanted to get from here is that music is a whole art. It's very important. You know, the problem is our ulama, Contemporary ulama do not study it in them. But if you look at the past Shia ulamas, you find that they have books on music, a whole book on music of what sound does what and so on. But today it has become a specialized field and the West is progressing. Have you realized some of these supermarkets having these very beautiful background music? You say that I want to go and buy only butter. I only buy butter. But you come out having done so much of shopping because they have worked on that sound for so many years. Right? So anyway, the location of the house is very important. As the child grows, when he comes out, in, in the West we have those, these billboards, isn't it, of naked women and so on and all these things. It should not be, the location should be very, very important. That when you come out, these things should not be seen and so on. Music, uh, nightclubs, uh, massage parlors and so on, all these dirty things which, are, which exist should not be near the, instead, mosques should be near the house, uh, libraries should be near the house, uh, neighbors should be very good, and so on. Location is important, yes. What happens when there's nightclubs and the mosque next to the house? This is a very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> if you can avoid that place also, it's good because obviously the mosque is a good thing, but the nightclubs are not. Like for example, when I went to Reunion, Reunion Islands, the university was here and the mosque compound was here. And you know, there, I, told, I was told 80% are uh, illegal offsprings. 80% of, of that Reunion Islands. There's a lot of facade and all that. So literally, if you look, if you go to that mosque and come out, you'll find uh, these people coming out with clothes, inexpressible, you can't even look at them, from university. So such a location is not good, although you said it's a mosque, but then such a location, the house should not be in that location. And when you go with your children, tell them that, you know, have taqwa. And obviously, there is one point I would like to tell you, something that will really help you. Don't think by closing the doors and not making them see these bad things, they will be very powerful, no. You have to always tell them in the while you are eating, while you are, for example, playing with them and so on, that please don't do this because, of course, as they grow, those when they are young, they don't know these things, so you don't have to tell them. Especially in this first period, you don't have to talk to them about these things. You are not teaching them practically. Uh, you are not teaching them instruction. You are teaching them practically. Actually. So location is one. Number two, environment. Of, for the five senses and the facilities of imagination and estimation. 
There's a very important thing that has been mentioned by Allama Tabatabai and other scholars also. And that is, you know, we are told that the doors of hell are seven. And the doors of heaven are how many? Eight. How? The five senses and the kuwa of khiyal, that you know, kuwa of khiyal is the imagination, that kind, that part of imagination that imagines objects. For example, you imagine a camera, you imagine this house, you imagine so many things, these physical things. This is known as khiyal. And then what we call wahm is there. Wahm is not how we conceive. Wahm is atar wahm, you know, you, this is something which is wrong. No, wahm means when you think about metaphysical things, like for example, when you think that my mother loves me, so this love and thinking of love is in a part of the brain which is not the same as the imagination which talks about the physical objects. So these are the seven doors of hell. These are seven doors of hell. The eyes, you can either watch halal or haram. The ears also, the same. All the five senses have a halal and have a haram. Imagination also, you can imagine to do good, good things for other people, how to help other people and so on. You can also imagine how to, for example, make a person de what to get degraded in the society and so on. Similarly, wham, you can hate, think about hating a person and you can think about loving a person and so on. So these seven are the abuab of Jahannam and Jannah, all right? the doors of heaven and hell. But there is one door, which is the door of intellect. Where, you know, the intellect, I always say, intellect is like that sharp sword. If shaitan comes, it hits shaitan. Shaitan only go, can go in wahm and khiyal only. But aql, aql is like a sharp sword. When you understand intellectually, it, you, you go forward and you get jannah. Because of aql you get jannah. Some of the ulama also say that it is not only aql, but it is the heart. One who has a pure heart, only he can go to jannah. So this is the eighth door, which is only of jannah. Jahannam has no way in that heart or the intellect and so on. So I just want to tell you that if you facilitate good things for these five senses and the kuwa wahmiya and fiyaniya for seven years then you see in the eighth year this person is so powerful at in the table when he talks to you you think subhanallah how does he think like this how does he imagine like this i whenever i talk to him he's optimistic he's never pessimistic why because you made that environment for seven years to be always optimistic. You know, in the table, if somebody says that ah mani sari in the najwa, you can't get ah ah ah, the father says, please stop over here. How do you know that he thought this, this, this? No, no, perhaps this, perhaps that, perhaps that. Subhanallah. So he's registering, he's not discussing because he's young, he can't discuss. But after seven years, if somebody talks to him pessimistically, he will say, wait a minute, how do you know? Maybe it is this, we are told that to think about a moment 40 times on different issues and that perhaps he forgot, perhaps he was not well, perhaps he did this because of this. And then you come after 40, if you get something, then you say, okay, he did wrong. You know, like I give I give this example that, you know, you always you have a friend in the mosque and one day you go, and you see that, that the friend is also not looking at you properly. So the first thing shaitan comes in the mind and tells you, Ato modu charavich. Ato modu charavich. And kiam modu charavich, can't you? Oh, that person is affiliated to that. Shaitan is always is giving you a whole path. You know why this person is acting like this? Because of the friend that she has there. And that one is, doesn't like me. And now, and you know, you, it's cooking inside and you start hating this person. After two days, you come to realize that she had come in the mosque, but she was not feeling well. And that's why she, she, she had never called all the many people. It was not because she, she had any kind of rancor in her heart. 
So whenever we see these experiences, we should not conclude. Optimism is actually a key which is very vast. All right. When we talk about uh, environment, the, the controlling these things, there is one thing also. I think my time is over, isn't it? Nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want me to continue for 10 minutes, recite a salawat, please. So I'll take another 10 minutes and then. <laughs> you see, I just talked to you of something very important. Listen to this, this is fundamental. I think from the entire course, if you get this key, then you will know how to control your children. The human being has three important faculties. Some people take it as four, all right? But these three important faculties are there. One, the faculty of intellect. For this, I would like you to refer to the book of Tony Buzan, known as Brain Child. All right? He has, he has discussed very nicely that how can you tap the potential of the child in various ways and make it very powerful from a young age. Okay? The intellectual faculty, the second is the, uh, the appetitive faculty. That, you know, the, the faculty that makes you eat and have uh, uh, intimacy with the wife and so on. All right, this is the second faculty. The third faculty is the faculty, they call it the irascible faculty or the faculty of anger. These three are the main faculties that you have and your child also has. The way you have controlled them, the child observes and he also follows suit. i give you an example. Let's not ex give example of intimacy and all that. That comes afterwards, all right? I'm talking about this first seven years. Eating. You find the father, every three, three minutes, he's opening the fridge. And either drinking soda or eating apple or taking ice cream or I'm, I'm giving you an example. Every every 10, 10 minutes, every or every time, not 10, 10 minutes, I don't want to give a, a, a specific figure. And also the mother, we can also say the mother also does that because she's, she's at home. She likes to munch after every maybe half an hour, whenever she wants and so on. The, the young child is observing this. And he also does this. And the mother, because of the mercy she has, she says, Baba, no problem and he opens the fridge. After about five years, you find him a fat boy. And you start saying, ah, can you pull down, please? And all that. Who started this? You started. Because you allowed your habits to get into him. But if, for example, you were very disciplined, you even closed the fridge, and you opened it at different and specific times, and you did not eat in the middle, just like that, carelessly. You'll find the child also doing the same. Even if he's hungry, they say, Amnan, time of eating has not yet come after about one hour, so let me go and play, for example. Because we have discipline with the soul. But let's say you did not discipline. After seven years, it's going to be difficult. It's not, it's not impossible, no. In fact, after 21 years, when even the child of bringing finishes, there is a method of how to bring them again properly. Inshallah, we'll talk about that. That now that my boy has become, let's say, 17 years, how can I rectify? Can I do that? You can. There is a methodology. We'll talk about it afterwards. But with regard to the, the, the what, uh, faculty of uh, anger also, it's the same. Let's say there are some people who have the habit of getting sensitive in small things or getting angry in small, small issues. You know, the other person will say, I know the deal is soft, but yeah, angry, angry, thank you, but deal is soft. That is wrong. Because this anger is registered by the child, and he will also have the same kind of temperament. When he goes outside, he's going to bully people, he's going to blow people, he's going to do so many things. Just because he has been trained like that, the irascible faculty, the faculty of anger, has been not been controlled properly. Why? Because the parents are also not controlled. So the child also will not be controlled. So the appetitive faculty and the, the faculty of anger. Another faculty that I said is the faculty of intellect. 
you can train the child in various ways. I just want to give you one example, and then inshallah, we stop, we'll look at it tomorrow, and then we'll look at the other phases also. This example is this. You have, one day, you take, you have about two pairs of keys of a certain house, okay, of your home. You have a property, you are staying in that house, you go out, when you come back, intentionally you throw the key, or you, you hide the key from the child. And now when you come to the house, you say, well, you, nothing, there is no key, so what should we do? Now you are making the child think, what should we do? Papa, up and go, climb, karo. climb. This, so the climb kar is, is going to be difficult for me. Give me another idea. I told you now. Ha, he wants to see how it's going to be broken, you know, experience. Then you say, but what do you think? Give me another way of doing it. Then the child will say, you know, the neighbor, last time the child, the, 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 the key got stolen or got lost, he climbed over there and then he came and opened. That's the best way. He said, but he's not there. So now as you are asking the questions, he's analyzing. But that is your benefit because this analysis, this analyzing, you're stimulating the mind and you're making it very powerful. Sometimes a subject would come when he's about five years, six years, and he can speak and he discuss. You just talk about other in the while you're eating with him. And you say, you know, you talk about other and then you say, what do you think about it? And he will give his own experience and start analyzing. It's very important. Similarly, there is something what we call retentivity, creativity. Retentivity, creativity, all these things are dimensions of the brain. You can do it. Tony Buzan, the author of Brain Child, gives very good examples. He says, you take them to the garden. Tell them to touch things naturally, smell them, listen to the birds chirping, uh, play with water, and so on. You'll come to know that they will have an exposure of different kinds of things. One thing that is happening a lot in us, and I know, I'm not saying a lot, but perhaps it has happened with you, is that you know sometimes you keep your best iPad, iPad 2, uh, iPad Air 2, for example, with you here, and there is Chai also, and the child is also with you, and you're saying, Baba, how are you? And he kicks that, uh, you know, Chai, and the Chai drops over the iPad, and the iPad falls down, and it cracks, and all that, and then what do you do? You start scolding. But who was at fault? It was you, because you don't keep these things. It wants to experience, it wants to kick, it wants to touch. So make sure that you give him an environment where he can kick, touch, tear. Sometimes you know, for example, with us, we have a lot of books. So we should be very careful that the child doesn't come near the books. Otherwise, you'll find that tearing and all this is experience. And this is the best kind of experience it gains. Because it wants to see what it is, how does it feel, how does it sound, and so on. Another very important point in this stage, very quickly, it's known as brain stimulation. And one of uh, my friends has tried this with the children. And the children have grown very, very receptive, very fast. Brain stimulation is that, you know, at a certain age, make the child see different colors, taste different tastes. But not mechanically, you know, the way, okay, now test this, now test, no, not like that. <laughs> naturally, it should be in an environment where it should be naturally done. Like, you know, when, while you're in a garden, you're eating, for example, different kinds of fruits, popo and, and for example, uh, different, different kinds of fruits. So there are different tastes, and you make him taste a bit. So while you're making him taste, it stimulates the brain, because the brain registers another kind of stimulation. It has been proven that such children who get different kinds of touch and different kinds of, for example, color to see and all these things, the brain is stimulated. They think fast because the brain is always stimulated. It's working now and again. But as I told you, don't make it such that it is like a mechanical job. 
because it can backfire. It should be like going to the garden, having a picnic, and you know that consciously, although we, we are enjoying by, by sitting with our friends, but the child also, we are working on him. Very, very important. There are so many things, inshallah, I will also give you some reading material so that you can read. As I told you, this is not a very full-fledged course because we only have two days. We will continue tomorrow, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, alameen. وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين